forth such an important topic uh, and uh, with uh, you know with uh, with an anesthesiologist as eminent as dr santosh speaking upon uh, about it uh, we all know that in the current uh, in the current times use of uh, endoscopic procedure has really come up it is benefiting so many patients uh, in so many ways we are able to do so many procedures on outdoor basis and so we we it's our duty to put all these patients into a comfort zone ele their anxiety so that the gastroenterologist can complete their procedure in time in time as well as with uh, comfort they can uh, examine the patient and uh, properly look at all those hidden polyps here and there and they can take a biopsy plus uh, other things which dr santosh will be talking about uh, are required by the en endoscopist can these all things can actually be you know facilitated uh, when the patients are under sedation so uh, these days there are so many endoscopic procedures which we undertake which will be highlighted by dr santosh and it's my uh, proud privilege to introduce dr santosh who is currently heading the division of endoscopic anesthesia and uh, is chief of anesthesiologist at a very uh, super speciality hospitals aig hyderabad so i welcome you dr santosh and i will now uh, like to open the session with your talk thank you good evening uh, please enable the screen share Yes. Uh, yes. Good evening to the chairpersons and dear colleagues. I thank the organizers of E Part Shala for giving me this opportunity to be here today. Today I am going to speak on anesthesia during endoscopic procedures. As endoscopic evolved, your challenges crop up for endoscopic anesthesia. The last two decades have seen significant developments in this area which has unwrapped both opportunities and challenges to the anesthesiologist. The time-tested general anesthesia and airway management techniques are largely considered overkill in GI endoscopy. Thus, endotracheal intubation or laryngeal mask airway is mainly for rescue and inhalation anesthesia is impractical as you all know. Sedation may be defined as a drug-induced depression in the level of consciousness. The purpose is to relieve patient anxiety and discomfort, improve the outcome of the procedure, and diminish the patient's memory of the event. TIVA is what we are using. It's used for almost 90 to 95 percent of the endoscopic procedures. It's a general method of producing anesthesia by injecting intravenous drugs, excluding simultaneous administration of any inhalation agent. The basic requirement of ideal sedation or TIVA is the most important is patient safety. The drugs we use should have a fast induction. The drug should have a short duration of action, should not have any cumulative effect. Drug should have in inactive, non-toxic, water-soluble metabolites. Should not have so that there is no hangover, and should not have should have a fast recovery. And drug should have a minimal cardiovascular and respiratory side effects, minimal post-operative complications. See the difference between both the pictures. The one is an end of a patient undergoing a routine upper GI who is not very cooperative. You need five people to pin him down. While just one anesthesiologist with a propulsive syringe to knock him out. The four stages of sedation described are ranging from minimal sedation, moderate sedation, deep sedation, or general anesthesia. MAC or monitored anesthesia care, what you call, is a continuum that can range widely and is not always predictable. In general, most endoscopic procedures are done in moderate to deep sedation. Minimal sedation or anxiolysis, the responsiveness is normal to verbal stimulation, airway is unaffected, spontaneous ventilation is unaffected, and cardiovascular function is unaffected. In moderate sedation, the responsiveness is purposeful to verbal or tactile stimulation. No airway intervention is required. Adequate spontaneous ventilation is always there. Cardiovascular functions are usually maintained. 
In deep sedation, there is a purposeful response following repeated or painful stimulation. Airway intervention may be required. Spontaneous ventilation may be inadequate. Cardiovascular function is usually maintained. While in general anesthesia, patients are unarousable even with painful stimulus. Airway intervention is often required. Spontaneous ventilation is frequently inadequate and cardiovascular function may be impaired. The modified Ramsey scale and the observer's assessment of the sedation scale are the usual two scales which we commonly use for scoring the sedation scores. Patient evaluation is very important irrespective of whether you are doing it with anesthesia or without anesthesia. Basically, look for abnormalities of any major organ system, any previous experiences with sedation, bad experiences with sedation, anesthesia, or surgery, the current medications they are on so that we can plan for your drug interactions and all that, history of allergic reactions, fasting interval before the procedure, history of tobacco, alcohol, or substance abuse. And also monitor the vital signs, auscultation of the heart and lung, and evaluation of the airway, head and neck. That is very important. Basically, all endoscopies, I think, make it a habit to have a checklist so that you don't miss out on anything. The AC guidelines for pre-procedure fasting. For clear liquids, the minimum fasting period is two hours. For breast milk, four hours. For infant formula, six hours. For non-human milk, six hours. For a light meal, six hours. For a heavy meal, eight hours. And patients with diabetes and other conditions which delay the gut motility can be eight hours or more. In situations where gastric emptying is impaired or in emergency situations, the potential for pulmonary aspiration of gastric consumption must be considered. So the decision should be taken depending on the gravity of the situation. Like sometimes the patient has Children, children come with ingested small uh, batteries, so you can't wait irrespective on a full stomach. So ideal is to put in a tube, endotracheal tube, and then get it out. The common problems in GI procedures is retching during endoscope intubation. This is commonly seen irrespective of the depth of anesthesia in some patients. So don't always look at the anesthetist if the patient is retching. Some people ha do have sensitive throats, they continue to retch unless you give general anesthesia. And always treat any patient coming for an endoscopy as a full stomach, then you will definitely be, be on the safer side. Fluid in the esophagus, you will see only when you diagnose after seeing the fluid. So ecclesia, unless you get a proper history, there is always a chance. Then bleeding viruses, Blood in the stomach, you usually see in malarivy stairs, bleeding duodenal ulcers, bleeding gastric ulcers, gave or bleeding fundal viruses. Desaturation is another common site in quite a lot of endoscopy suits because of not improper titration of the drugs. So the best way is to mask them for some time with an ambu, then 99% the they come out easily. Hypotension, if they are not properly hydrated, they hydrate the patient. They settle down. There is a five to six fold higher incidence of patients of arrhythmias in patients coming with pre existing cardiac disease during endoscopy. Even the size of the endoscope does matter in triggering arrhythmias. Hypoxemia can trigger arrhythmias, and any pre morbid cardiac disease also can produce arrhythmias during a routine endoscopy. An ideal patient for endoscopy is one who has been fasting more than 8 hours, pre-assessed and worked up, pre-medicated with an anti-emetic like Adancetron or Ramacetron and good, having a good venous axis in C2. As you all know, the routine commonest positions which we do the procedures are left lateral position, prone and supine position. Left lateral position, of course, the routine upper GI colon, U.S. and single balloon. That is the safest position for all the procedures. Prone position for ERCP. ERCP, there is a 20% decrease in the respiratory reserve the minute the patient is put in a prone position. And there is a high probability of aspiration unless the stomach is empty. Supine position is another 
unfavorable position because they do beg ERCP in the, some of the units of pancreatic endotherapies are done in supine position. Patients with advanced pregnancy, patients with tense ascites, airway compromised patients, ASA grade 4 patients or patients with fractures of long bone or spine. ERCP is done in a supine position. There is a high probability of aspiration in these patients. And in patients, heavy patients coming for ERCP also, it's difficult to put them on prone position. The basic guidelines for non-operating room anesthetizing locations, because this is basically, TIVA is anesthesia outside the operation theater. So you should have reliable oxygen source with a good backup, good suction source, adequate monitoring equipment, self-inflating resuscitator bag, sufficient safe electrical outset, emergency cart with defibrillator, emergency drugs, and emergency equipment. Better, I mean, remember this acronym SOAP ME because most of quite a lot of endoscopy units I have seen all over the country. There is definitely there is some amount of compromise. It is never an operation theater. Try to recollect this SOAP ME is S for suction, O for oxygen, A for airway equipment, P for pharmacy, that's emergency drugs, M for monitors, and E for equipment or defibrillators. Ideal endoscopy room is one with a good ERCP, good resuscitation equipment, and a table I'm stressing is one which can give you both Trendelenburg and anti Trendelenburg positions. Advanced endoscopic procedures, as you all know, are ERCP, US, both diagnostic and therapeutic, spiral endoscopy, both anti grade and retrograde, single balloon endoscopy, OM. All endosco therapeutic endoscopic procedures like ESD, EMR, STIR, Zenkers, colonic procedures. These procedures need special attention as far as sedation or anesthesia is considered. The procedures to be done in Trendelenburg position, I'm just telling you with experience, is therapeutic US procedures with walled off necrosis drainage, then direct uh, necrosectomies. US GJ, US HGS or hepaticogastrostomy. Enteral sense for gastric outlet obstructions. These people invariably will have a full stomach. So, in a head low, Trendelenburg position, left lateral, chances of aspiration is negligible. Gastric and esophageal bleed therapies. If you do not have a, a table which cannot give you Trendelenburg position, ideally is to intubate the patient. Topical pharyngeal spray with 10% lidocaine is very, very useful for smooth intubation. It'll definitely minimize the retching in patients. It's contraindicated in patients with the lidocaine allergy. Evolution of drugs in conscious sedation is in the 80s, we were in diazepam and diazepam with pentazosin. In the 90s, early 90s, midazolam was launched and then it was midazolam or midazolam in combination with pentazosin. Late 90s, we switched over to propofol once it was launched, and it is propofol, propofol in combination with midazolam or fentanyl. Later, propofol, it was midazolam with sufentanyl. And then from 2007 to 2023, we are still continuing the same combination of propofol or propofol with midazolam, ketamine, and pentazosin or butyphenol. We call it a sedato analgic cocktail. We have done a work on uh, RCT on combination of, I mean, comparison between propofol and a propofol with sedatoanalgesic and the results are pretty good with sedatoanalgesic cocktail. The common drugs which we use in the endoscopy suits are diazepam, it's almost obsolete now. It is alarm, the effects are sedation, amnesia, and anxiolysis. The duration of action is two to six hours. A typical dose is 0.5 to 5 milligrams, but it should be titrated. The side effects are hypotension, hypoventilation. Ketamine is effective use for sedation. Duration of action is 10 to 20 minutes. The typical dose is 1 to 2 milligrams for kg body weight inter given intravenously. Side effects are hallucinations, tachycardia, dissociate anesthesia, and patients prone for convulsions. Convulsions is definitely a possibility. 
Fentanyl, sedation and analgesia, duration is 30 to 60 minutes. Dose is 1 to 2 mics per kg body weight. I put ventilation and hypotension on the side effects. Propofol, basically for sedation, duration of action is 3 to 10 minutes. Typical dose is 1 to 2 milligrams per kg body weight, but titration is must. Side effects are hypotension and hypoventilation. Etomidate, sedation, duration of action is 3 to 10 minutes. Typical dose is 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams per kg body weight. I repeat the word titration. You may hear more and more from me again and again. Respiratory depression and nausea, the other side effects. The reversal agents which should be stored in our endoscopy suits are naloxone for opiates. The dosing is 20 to 100 mics repeated every two minutes till the respiratory function is regained. And another drug which should be kept in our shelf is flumazil for benzodiazepines. Dose is 0.2 milligram given every minute until desired level of consciousness is achieved. The newer drugs which have been introduced are dexmeridomidin, remimazolum, remifentanil, and fosprofol. Of course, the bottom three are still not launched in India. I'll just talk a few words about propofol. It's a lipophilic, short-acting anesthetic agent. Just got a fast distribution in elimination time. It's an oil water emulsion. Delivered, I mean, coming in 1% or 2% propofol. So when you are taking propofol, please double check whether it is 1% or 2% propofol. It is metabolized in the liver and excreted by the kidney. Injection, so onset of sedation is 30 to 60 seconds. Duration of effect, effect is 4 to 8 minutes. Dose is 1 to 2 milligrams per kg body weight. Please do not go by the bookish figures. Please titrate. It has got a, advantages are it's got a rapid onset of action. It's got pleasant pharmacodynamics, mild anti properties, very rapid termination of effect. It's got an expirated recovery. It's quite safe in patients with renal failure and moderately severe chronic liver disease. The disadvantages is pain on injection in about 30% of the patients, but preferably select a larger gauge vein, then this can be overcome. It's got a narrow therapeutic spectrum. Potential to induce general anesthesia is high. Potential for hemodynamic and respiratory depression is also high. It has got some epileptogenic uh, properties. Hiccups and immunosuppression can happen when used in high doses. No specific reversal agent or antagonist. No analgesic properties. Target control infusion pumps are used in some of the units. It's a pharmacokinetically based model with an infusion system that is computer controlled. The patient data are entered. System adjusts the medication to the desired plasma concentration or physiological parameters. It has got an auto shutoff uh, mechanism in case of malfunction. Age is the major limitation factor. It can't be used in all the patients. Computer-assisted personalized sedation, we were trying to introduce, but didn't get very popular. It works on multiple physiological para feedback parameters, including ECG, capnography, patient response to otic and vibratory stimuli. May provide an alternative, safe and effective means to deliver propofol without the assistance of an anesthesiologist. It is basically meant for nurse anesthesia, anesthetists. It is designed primarily for low-risk patients above 18 years for EGD and colonoscopy. Dexmeritomidin is another new drug. It has got selective alpha adrenic agonist actions with sedative properties. It is metabolized in the liver and excreted by the kidney. It is administered at a losing, loading infusion of 1 mic per kg body weight over 10 minutes. This 10 minutes, there is no compromise on 10 minutes. If you try to push in fast, there can be severe bradycardia. It is followed by a maintenance infusion of 0.2 to 0.7 mics per kg per hour. It has got sedative, anxiolytic and analgesic properties. The basic advantage of this drug is it has no respiratory depression, has a short half-life. The side effects are hypertension and bradycardia. 
must consider dosage reduction in patients with renal impairment, hepatic impairment, and pain geriatric patients. It needs continuous close monitoring. Itomidate, another drug which is quite useful in endoscopy suits, is it's got a it's a hypnotic drug without any analgesic activity. It's got like propofol, a rapid onset of action, usually within one minute. The duration of hypnosis again, three to five minutes. Dosage is, as I already mentioned, is 0.15 to 0.5, but I'm repeating again, titrate. Titrate and give the drug. It is rapidly metabolized in the liver. No effect on the heart rate, cardiac output, peripheral circulation, or pulmonary circulation. It is very safe in cardiac patients. Minimal or no respiratory depression, depending on the dosing. Adverse effects are pain on injection and transient skeletal muscle movements, including myoclonus. In elderly patient, it will almost look like he is having a convulsion, but don't get worried about it. An ideal way to sedate a patient for gastroscopy, colonoscopy, or uh, ERCP is for gastroscopy, we routinely use only propofol in adults. It dominate in ASA grade 3 to grade 4 patients or patients with cardiac problems. Ketamine and midazolam in pediatric patients. Colonoscopy, diagnostic colonoscopy, we generally use propofol alone. A cocktail, a sedative analgesic cocktail may be added for therapeutic procedures or for restless patients. ERCP again, sedative analgesic cocktail followed by titrated doses of propofol. You at least a minute's time after the serotonin cocktail and the propofol, your procedure will go on a little more smoothly. Deep sedation for painful procedures, you may have to top it up, especially when there are stricture dilatations during ERCP or colons or an upper GI. So you have to supplement some analgesics. And in very sick patients, we usually use the dexmedidone infusion. Timing of injection is another very important uh, thing, which most of us don't be, tend to ignore. Sedative drug should be administered after endoscopy is ready to introduce the endoscope. Please do not sedate the patient, then, then go and uh, start looking around for a gastroenterologist. Dosing time should be such that the peak clinical effect should coincide with endoscope insertion. This practice re-establishes continuous ventilation if the patient was apneic because there will definitely be some amount of respiratory depression after giving propofol. So if the timing is right, that small stimulation of the scope near the larynx is enough to get him breathing back again. So you don't have to worry about the apnea. The common solutions for the problems we face day to day is relieve upper way obstruction because with slight uh, strider-like picture, you use a neck extension and chin tilt maneuver. Keep a nasopharyngeal tube handy, especially in patients with short neck or a large tongue because there's high probability of the fallback of tongue. And endoscopies, I advise is the minute you go in, aspirate the gastric and esophageal contents before, start look, before you start looking around. Position of the table, if you treat every patient as a patient with full stomach, keep them in trendelbar position, you will be 100% safe. No aspiration. O2 flow with the nasal prongs of a minimum of 2 liters cuts off your uh, desaturation to quite a significant technique. Dosing of drugs in uh, patients with jaundice, severe CKD, and extremes of age is important. One more thing you must, if you can, get hold of it. A thick foamed wedge in your ERCP room. It is very useful if you put it below the right shoulder. It, it, the elevation of the right shoulder in a patient in a prone position, the, the chances of desaturation is definitely lesser because it gives more room for chest expansion. And especially if you put him in a Trendelenburg position with this wedge, chances of aspiration also is almost negligible. A few words about anesthesia for ESWL because now I think the ESWL is being introduced in some of your units there. For pancreatic calculi or large CBD stones, we generally plan uh, 
segmental thoracic epidural block. We have done at least more than, I think, close to 10,000 procedures. We generally put it in the D7 to D9 space. We preload the, pre the patients with colloid. Drug of choice, the ropey weekend, 0.5%. We give a loading dose of 3 to 5 ml, depending on the patient. The advantage is predominantly it's only sensory block. Dexmeridro infection we use in only anxious patients. It's quite safe. How to customize your technique as per the patient's condition is use 10% lidocaine spray, avoid cocktail in elderly and sick patients, titrate propofol, modify the position of patient as per the requirement, etominate for patients with severe cardiac disease, Supplemental oxygen delivery with nasal prongs prevents desaturation in most of the patients. Another uh, device which has been added to our armamentarium recently is OptiFlow Thrive. Thrive stands for Transnasal Humidified Rapid Insufflation Ventilatory Exchange. This device consists of a water bag, a high flow meter, heated uh, humidifier, a heated wire patient circuit, and a nasal cannula, as you see on the left side, which is very soft uh, silicon uh, catheter. It optimizes oxygenation and improves patient safety. It facilitates washing out of carbon dioxide in the anatomical dead space. This the dynamic positive pressure generated for every 10 liters of minute flow increase. There is a 0.5 to 1 centimeter of water increase. Is the airway pressure. So the airway pressure is maintained at around 3 to 7 centimeters of water. There is an increase in mean airway pressure recruits, so hence there is more recruitment of more alveoli. It prevents airway collapse and small airway closure. It increases the end expiratory lung volume, enables delivery of high flow rates up to 70 liters per minute of 100% oxygen, which is not done in most of these high flow nasal cannulas. Pre-oxygenation with Thrive, about, uh, you can pre-oxygenate at least two, three minutes prior to the starting of the procedure. It delivers peak inspiratory flow, three to 60 liters per minute during spontaneous breathing, decreases the inspiratory resistance, it minimizes the work of breathing, and it is quite effective in denitrogenation and increasing the functional residual capacity of the lung. On room air, the normal lung contains 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% of organ with carbon dioxide. After pre-oxygenation, you can see a 100% oxygenated lung. Heated humidification reduces patient anxiety and improves patient concern. I've seen that patients tolerate it very well, even if you're pumping in at 60 liters per minute, the humidified oxygen is very well tolerated. Patients with population at risk of desaturation, the one with high BMI, difficult airways, patients with obstructive sleep apnea, and the elderly, and patients with pre-existing respiratory pathology. Why OptiFly thrive in J endoscopy? It optimizes oxygenation throughout the procedure, prevent hypoxemia, and improves patient safety, minimizes likelihood of airway-related interruptions during the procedure. Normally, sometimes you tend to, again, stop the procedure, so the patient desaturates. This does not happen, at least after we started using this, at least in the sicker ones, we have not seen any desaturation. It has improved the patient comfort and tolerance. Apneic ventilation is also possible. We have tried out in some patients where patient is apneic, we can keep him ventilating, keep ventilating him without desaturation up to 15 minutes. The basic mon another thing in mo basic monitoring is essential even in units where there is no sedation. It has become mandatory now. So the basic monitoring is clinical monitoring, monitoring of the oxygenation by pulse oximetry, monitoring of the cardiovascular stated by BP, heart rate, and ECG. The advanced monitoring is transcutaneous monitoring, which is quite close to the ABG. Capnography is entitled carbon dioxide. In most of the advanced procedures, this gives us the depth of a bispectral index scale, gives us the depth of sedation or anesthesia. And Palmovent is another device that gives us an idea of 
these different segments of the lung, how they are being ventilated. These are all the four devices. Recording of the parameters of late has become mandatory. Basically, maintain a record before the beginning of the procedure, after administration of sedation and analgesic agents, at regular intervals of five minutes duration during the procedure, during initial recovery period, and just before discharge from the PSU unit. Emergency equipment and medication for emergency resuscitation should be available when sedation and analgesic are being administered, because usually a patient being targeted for one level of sedation may become more deeply sedated than planned. Even though we talk about moderate sedation for most of our procedures, invariably they end up in deep sedation. For deep sedation, an anesthesiologist is the ideal person to be around as he would be able to provide a secure airway. Patients with history of strider, snoring or sleep apnea, the ones with dysmorphic facial features, oral abnormalities such as small mouth opening, edentulous patients, protruding incisors, loose or capped teeth, obesity with short neck, cervical spine disease or trauma, patients with jaw abnormalities such as micronathia, retronathia, trismus or significant malignancy. These patients have to be handled with extreme cautions. You are likely to get into trouble unless you are careful. The problems with drugs used by endoscopists is common, uh, most commonly used drugs like buscopan causes extreme tachycardia in some of the patients. So you have to be careful when you are using in patients with cardiac problems. The alternative for buscopan is glucagon, where it doesn't produce any tachycardia. It can be used in incremental loads of 0.25 to 2 milligrams. Adrenaline for bleeders is another an adrenaline injection, if there is an intravascular injection, it can be catastrophic. Somatostatin, if you give rapidly, can cause bradycardia. Cyanacriclate uh, glue, we routinely use for quite a lot of procedures, but if their patients are not properly counseled, you can end up in problems like pulmonary or systemic arterial embolism can lead to death. General anesthesia, we usually give for foreign bodies stuck in the upper third of the esophagus, endotherapy for zencus, routinely for pancreatic endotherapy in some centers, paroral endoscopic myotomy for ecclesia, DPOM, ZPOM, GPOM, ESDs for neuroendocrine tumors or gastrointestinal stromal tumors, STIR for leomyomas. I'll talk a little about general anesthesia for Poem is off late. Quite a lot of units. Poem is being done. We patient, keep the patients nil orally for 24 hours. Esophagoscopy before poem to clear the esophagus of liquid and food residue because invariably there will be some amount of liquid. So try to put the patient in Trendenburg position as, as the endoscopist to suck out all the liquid before giving general anesthesia. We anesthetize after the cleaning is over. Anesthetize and intubate the patient using propofol and a muzzle relaxant. Ideally, use a reinforced endotracheal tube so that there is no kinking when they are manipulating. We monitor the ECG, SpO2, blood pressure, and end tidal carbon dioxide. The position is supine. As I said, propofol with cisaticurium and rocky peronium are the muzzle relaxant of choice. Tube. See that the cuff is properly inflated because during poem, a lot of water is kept, uh, pumping in, kept pumping in, and there's sometimes bleeds and all, so there's a chance of aspiration. Analgesics, we use fentanyl, paracetamol, diclofenac, or ibuprofen, any one of them. Maintenance is usually with oxygen and air, 50% each. Relax, and I already mentioned dexmedetone infusion of uh, 0.2 to 1.4 mics per kg per hour. In case the pressures are going up, we use nitroglycerin and uh, beta blockers if the heart rates are going up. And the uh, inhalational agent of choice is sevoflurane. Entitled carbon dioxide, just one extra word about it. It is mandatory if you are doing poem. 
Because normal ETC2 range is 35 to 45, but stop the procedure if the ETCO2 is crossing beyond 50. Because after that, you start seeing the adverse events. The adverse events which we commonly see in POEM are capnoneuma peritoneum, subcutaneous emphysema, mediastinal emphysema, capnoneumothorax, hemorrhage, hypercarbia, arrhythmias, pleural effusion, segment atelectasis of the lung, or carbon dioxide embolism. The commonest is seen in uh, the pneumo capnoneuma peritoneum is seen in about 20% of the cases. There is an increase in airway pressure and increase in ETCO2. It can be easily picked up by a fluoroscopic image. If you do not have flora in the room, try the obliteration of the liver dullness. If you ignore it, then the possibility of desaturation is there. The best way to drain off the pneumoperitoneum is introduce a 18 gauge cannula in the anterior axillary line on the right side just below the coastal margin. Direct the needle in a flat direction. <coughs> then you connect it to an underwater seed. You can see the CO2 bubbling out. Retain it till the end of the procedure. So it's always better to have a controlled fistula so you can have the allow the endoscopist to continue with his work. Surgical emphysema is generally seen mostly in the neck and face. It's not very common, but nothing to get worried about. It generally gets absorbed by the time the procedure is over. Mediastinal emphysema we have seen in about 3% of the cases. You see a radiolescent outline around the heart and mediastinum. Intervention is required only if you see signs of cardiac tamponade. Introduce a needle just below the ziffit sternum under the floor, under fluoroscopic garden that drains off the carbon dioxide. Pneumothorax, as you see in both the images, the one on the left, you see, is seen in 2% of the cases. This is a small pneumothorax, usually small pneumothorax is going to go unnoticed. The patient presents with increased airway resistance, increased E2CO2, a decrease in tidal volume. That should get you alert. If you ignore it at that stage, you may end up with a tension pneumothorax. That's when you see a decrease in the ETCO2, decrease in the cardiac output, and decrease in the SpO2. If you still don't pick it up, then this is likely of circulatory collapse. The left, you see the image with a collapsed lung, and we introduce a uh, ICD on the right side, and then you see the mediastinum has shifted back to its original position. Retroperitoneal carbon dioxide leak is quite common. If you don't find a pneumoperitoneum and you're still the abdomen is tense, in spite of emptying the stomach, best is wait for some time till it gets absorbed. Give the endoscopist a coffee break. Hypercarbia is monitoring and keeping the ATC under check is very important. ETCO2 above 50, then you start seeing when it goes above 50 millimeters of mercury, then you start seeing tachycardia, high volume pulse, arrhythmias, then increased cardiac output. So the best way to get it corrected is by carbon dioxide washout, which can be done by positive index pressure in your anesthesia workstation by increasing the peep of keeping a peep of anything from 5 to 8 centimeters of water. Change over to 100% oxygen of fresh grass flow, increase with the respiratory rate, and wait till the ETCO2 is within normal regards. So these will wash out the carbon dioxide. You can continue the procedure only after the ETCO2 gets back to the normal range. The other complication like hemorrhage is endoscopic hemostasis, arrhythmias, you control hypercarbia automatically, the arrhythmias get controlled. If not, use lignocale bolus or amidurian infusion. Pleural effusion and segmental atelectasis of lung are very rare post-op complications. Carbon dioxide embolism is also very rare, but when it occurs, can be fatal. Wait for the ETCO2 to reach the normal range before planning extubation. Allow the surgical emphysema, if it is present, to get absorbed. Exhibition is usually done primarily on the table. 
post operative care we observe in the icu in if the patient has got any comorbidities otherwise up to an hour or so we shift him back to the room bradycardia is noted in some patients when there is anterior myotomy is done i think most probably there is more likelihood of some vagal stimulation good analgesia we given we get in the form of iv paracetamol or iv ibuprofen if the dose is inadequate you can top it up with either tramadol or diclofenac we keep the patients nil orally for 24 hours clear liquids after a time barium swallow after on day 2 we start them off on soft diet and discharge them on day 3 the recovery criteria after sedation and analgesia yeah, is medical supervision of recovery and discharge after board of deep sedation is mandatory the recovery area should be equipped with or have direct access to appropriate monitoring and resuscitation equipment patients receiving moderate or deep sedation should be monitored until appropriate discharge criteria are satisfied the duration and frequency of monitoring should be individualized depending on the level of sedation achieved the nature of intervention for which sedation analgesia was administered oxygenation should be monitored until patients are no longer at risk of respiratory depression patient should be in recovery area till the vital signs are stable and has reached an appropriate level of consciousness the nurse or the individual trained to monitor patients and recognize complications should be in attendance until discharge criteria are fulfilled an individual capable of managing complications example establishing a patent area providing positive pressure should be immediately available until discharge criteria are fulfilled in the pcu unit the role of anesthesiologist in endoscopic suit is make the procedure comfortable for the patient by giving good sedation and good analgesia make the patient comfortable for the endoscopy by seeing that he doesn't retch much and keeping him still avoid too deep or too little sedation use a sliding scale or a fixed dosing depending on the procedure pediatric patients take special precautions be an endoscope is confident in difficult situations so the message to endoscope is don't worry be happy with an anesthesiologist around thank you uh thank you very much uh, dr santosh you have covered almost everything um since we have about 10 15 minutes i think we will take the questions from the audience uh so that you know uh, yeah there are some questions coming up so let's see yeah yeah hello am i audible yes yes yes, yes. uh hello. thank you sir for such a nice lecture i had two two three questions the first is regarding the trendelenburg position for uh, us guided procedures so we here usually do all this kind of uh, endoscopic ultrasound guided procedure without anesthesia support so whenever what we face a problem is whenever the stent placement is correct there will be sudden gush of the fluid and that that is the reason why usually we do not give uh, want to give midazolam or anything because it will suppress the cuff reflex and might there might be a uh, chances of uh, aspiration so do you think that in th that situation this trendelenburg but position can be useful uh we uh, speak to dr jibil sorry sir yeah uh, is it jibil na yes yes sir ah uh, jibil so in my last 35 years of uh, endoscopic anesthesia i have not intubated any patient for endoscopic drainages so i always keep the patient because we do it on the floor table we put the patient in uh, i give them deep sedation with propofol and sedative analgesic cocktail put them in a good trendelenburg position i know we see a gush it comes out through the mouth and nose but i am assuring you patient will not aspirate if you get a good trendelenburg position patient will not aspirate and sir what degree you try to tilt the table around 20, 30 degree or 30 degrees 30 degrees okay uh, i i think uh, dr jimil was also trying to make a point on uh, midazolam as suppressing the airway reflexes i don't think midazolam suppresses airway reflexes in the doses which you use it just allays the anxiety 
So he had gone uh, from a very small dose, 0. 0.5 milligram uh, to 5 mg. Dr. Sandosh had mentioned. And I'm sure like uh, we are not using very higher doses for such procedures. So the doses in which you are going to you be sedating the patient are likely to keep the patient awake and uh, calm. Okay, ma'am. Uh, second, I had question regarding the titration of propofol. So if we, if a physician administered propofol, how, uh, at what point we should discuss that uh, we should titrate the dose or uh, like how, what what are the things that we should look for? If you want to increase the dose, what will be the starting dose and how you would like to uh, first, titrate? First and foremost, I would like to say that we do not encourage physicians to give propofol. The matter should end here <laughs> because uh, in our, uh, you know, ASA guidelines, it's been recommended that it should be administered by a person who is able to, you know, uh, take control of the airway because propofol is one drug which, you know, uh, which is very, uh, it can lapse into general anesthesia in no time. So from deep sedation to general anesthesia, you will not come to know because you yourself are doing endoscopy. Uh, in in uh, countries where nurse physicians are being allowed, they have to take a special training. Only then they are allowed. So in our setup, if we talk about India, it should be done. I do not know if Dr. Santosh agrees with me, but we do not allow physicians to use uh, propofol, especially those physicians who are endoscopists themselves. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. I don't advise because, see, basically you'll be concentrating on your monitor. So otherwise, you'll have to look at two monitors at the same time, watch his respirations, all that. I think it's you can't concentrate on your job. You likely put up missing something. While doing and uh, and the ASA claims, uh, uh, medical legal claims, have uh, you know written down. I have written this point. I knew you will ask it because I know I once once I had done a dental uh, you know uh, sedation panel, and every dentist wanted to give nitrous oxide. So there also I had made this point that most of the time over sedation and airway complications have been rated as the highest for medical legal claims in um, you know during propofol sedation even when administered by an anesthesiologist yeah because when i say titration what happens is one your hand is continuous on the syringe so with the, you operating your scope with two hands how can you titrate if the same yes. person has to do it. So, so if you have an you. gastro with you, then okay, that's a different outlook. But the same person doing it, I don't think it's possible. Yeah, no, like that, like uh, if our colleague or uh, resident doctor or if uh, the senior doctor can administer or not, but I think ma'am is now uh, very, gave us a clear kind of instruction <laughs> <laughs> what we should you follow. You can give midazolam uh, in titrated doses. Midazolam, you have to titrate and give, it's safe. Don't just push it in as a bonus. And that also you should know like elderly, debilitated, uh, yeah. asthenic, malnourished. You should avoid giving uh, midazolam by yourself. You should call for help. Okay. And one last question is ma'am regarding the sir, CO2 embolization. So, so CO2 embolization has been mainly reported for the laparoscopic procedure, but have you encountered or have you seen or read any uh, such exposure with third space endoscopy? Because we usually one have... A Chinese article was uh, mentioned, uh, somebody had mentioned about it, but I didn't see any publication as such. But uh, there are no deaths reported due to say, but there is a possibility. Yes. So yes. then you have Thank to you. give it an extreme uh, tunnel bug and get it up to the atrium and try to ask. Okay. Okay. I guess if you pick it up on time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Santosh, for a very comprehensive lecture on this topic. I just have a que few queries. One is you said prone ventilation reduces the respiratory reserves. But more and more pulmonologists are going into prone ventilation because it is physiologically allows better recruitment of the alveoli. So what is your view on prone positioning and respiratory issues? Now that is while ventilating or a sedated patient in prone position. What are the pulmonologists talking about? See, I'm talking about you are deeply sedating. For ERCP, you have to sedate deeply. See, this mild or moderate is not good enough for ERCP therapeutic procedures. So, a deeply sedated prone patient is definitely decreased in respiratory reserve. See, these pulmonologists, what they advise is when the patient is being ventilated, that is where your circulation, pooling and all, to prevent that pooling in the back of the, and in the, towards the back, they are advising prone. On the contrary, his, uh, Dr. Santosh has given a very brilliant tip that you can put one, you know, uh, that um, roll. Wedge. Wedge. 
or uh, under the chest so that uh, liberates the abdomen to uh, you know move freely as well as it improves the ventilation mm -hmm. so, yeah thank you uh, i have one more question for you uh, one is related to this concept of having you know when you have a difficult airway intubation and suppose you don't have an anesthetist patient is sick in the endoscopy room uh, how do you view using an endoscope to put in a guide wire into the trachea and follow it up with the ET tube? See, ultimately, even when you intubate, there is a stiff wire inside it. So sometimes one of our gastroenterologists has described this technique of using the endoscope to put in a guide wire into just pass the vocal cord and take it as a guide to put in your ET tube. You can use it. You've got a... Nasal endoscope, you can as well, it's as good as a bronchoscope. It's just a little bigger than a bronchoscope. You can... Uh, so, what fiber optic scopes we are using are 5 mm. Your scopes are 14 mm, I think. They're very thick. Is, so, uh, whether a patient... Nasal, nasal endoscope. Nasal endoscope. So, those are just... Those are not... Uh, the, those are personal experiences. We cannot tell the residents who are leaving from here that... Because tolerating all that procedure is also uh, very painful for the patient. There may be a, a sort of a, a stopgap arrangement by somebody. So this is only for an emergency situation. Uh, yeah, exactly. Can, exactly. I'm not advising that, but in Usha, general, Usha, on the on the other hand, uh, there is one company which is called Teleflex. They have brought in a laryngeal mask airway with the gastric airway. So there are two ports with one with which you can ventilate the patient, and the other port allows your 14 mm, um, uh, you know, uh, endoscope to pass through. Okay. But I, uh, I I have recently visited Tata and I saw that the the anesthesiologists over there are using this LMA gastro airway size three, four, and five, which takes a 14 mm endoscope. I do I uh, do not know about their um, you know practical utility because we haven't used it. But my, my anesthesiologist colleagues, they said that gastroenterologists are not very happy with it. Maybe. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I used it, but I don't see basically when do we require a LMA is to protect an airway in case of bleeds. So in case you want to do a banding, your banding scope doesn't go through it. That's what I told those guys. If you want us to use it, make the gauge bigger. Mm. Basically, in a US scope doesn't go through it. So for drainages and all, if you want to protect the airway, like Jamil was asking, that is where your LMA plays the role, but there also your scope doesn't go through. So therapeutic procedure, your therapeutic scope doesn't go through it. Just for a routine upper GI, why do you need an LMA? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's no and, uh, you spoke about pre-oxygenation with a nasal cannula. So quite often we have a large number of elderly people who are undergoing conscious endoscopy. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, use of uh, nasal cannula with high flow and we have it through a humidified uh, tube, uh, you know, a bottle. We don't have the system which you were talking about. Would that do the job in these patients, elderly people, to prevent desaturation and arrhythmias? Definitely, because it will uh, try to wash out the carbon dioxide and the nitrogen. Definitely, the chances of desaturation will be better. Okay. Thank you. I think there are lots of residents here and there are questions on the question answer uh, chat box. Dr. Kajal, you can address this. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, what is the role of midazolam alone in ERCP and what should be the ideal dose? I think you have already discussed that. Uh, for ERCP, I don't think the patient is, um, is going to tolerate alone midazolam. Uh, Dr. Santosh, what is your opinion on that? I think the success rate of the endoscopist is how still the patient is. Unless the patient is properly primed and then he accepts a little medicine. Because you take him a little deeper, then again he becomes restless. If he is not in his own conscious state. So it is, if you convince a patient, like in Japan, most of the procedures, the ready keeps telling us that they do it without sedation. The patients accept it. I mean, they prime the patient so well. I don't know how they tolerate it. But, uh, so, but just mid as, I don't know, it's difficult. The patient is definitely going to be a little restless. Okay, there are a couple of questions on, uh, I knew this question is definitely going to come. Sedation advice for the, in the absence of anesthesia setup. So, because everybody wants to do the jobs, uh, you know, by themselves. 
So I don't understand why we have to compromise on patient safety because endoscopist is busy looking at the pathology and they are they cannot you know look at both the ends. It's always better to place safe and uh, invest a bit in anesthesia setup, which is not very huge. Uh, it can be done with a small uh, in a small setup also. There is I don't think there is anything denying that. So um, I think I would say that please go ahead with the anesthesia setup uh, as. It, uh, there is always a risk of aspiration. There is a, always a risk of, you know, you are taking different positions. So um, on the airway, so so close to the airway. So it's always important to have another help in the room. Yes, definitely, I agree with you. Because sometimes in ERCP, sometimes when you can't cannulate, you change the patient to supine and all that. So there is always the possibility of aspiration is there. So there's another question on uh, tamidol versus nalbuvin, and there is a drug promethazine. Uh, uh, people are asking. So uh, the options are, are not listed in the pharmacopoeia of endoscopy in the literature. Uh, tramadol is basically an analgesic. It doesn't offer any sedative value. So we want sedation here. Uh, we have no experience with nalbuvin, and I didn't come across any um, uh, any trial uh, talking about nalbuvin in uh, endoscopy setup. For promethazine, it can just be given a night before. I don't think it does much uh, to... Um, it's not a, a smooth and um, efficacious sedative by itself. We've got better options. Yeah, that's true. And then uh, we but have one... Somebody asked me... Sorry? Tramadol causes a lot of nausea, especially... Yes, so for, for yeah. anesthesiologist, tramadol is always a no-no. No anesthesiologist is happy using tramadol. Yeah, I, don't like <laughs> I don't like it myself. So uh, there's one question on liver transplantation, liver transplant, any precautions on sevoflurane? I think it's unrelated to this. I don't know why we, uh, this is a whole lot of different thing. Uh, liver transplant and is it a transplanted patient coming for endoscopy for sevoflurane? I, I didn't understand this question. Uh, if the person is there, they can raise his hand and ask us what is exactly the query. Dr. Kondala Rao, Yedduputi. Because how does you plan to give sevoflurane endoscopy? That too for an ARCP. Yes, so I think the question may be something else. So uh, besides that, I the one question which is coming repeatedly is what can I use if I'm alone? So I think uh, the safest bet would be you use topical as much as you can. If you're doing upper, like we see our own uh, endoscopist, uh, Dr. Usha and all, I see them using generous topical uh, anesthesia like lignocaine they can use. That's uh, absolutely safe. I think colonoscopy is uh, quite well tolerated. There are certain points at which patient doesn't uh, feel very uncomfortable when you're injecting air. Otherwise, patients tolerate colonoscopy pretty well. And upper GI also, if you give them topical and you give them a good, uh, you know, um, you know, consolation reassurance, that's the way forward. If you are giving propofol, please ensure you have an anesthetist in place and you have minimum mandatory monitoring standards. Uh, if we talk about institutes, we should also have entitled carbon dioxide monitoring uh, in place for these patients. And um, through this web webinar, we do not advocate uh, that sedation uh, is given in the absence of anesthesiologists. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Yeah. OM, we, I think my ETCO2 is mandatory. Without ETCO2, you should not do a OM. Otherwise, May I ask? Yes. Yes, sir. So, so one question is regarding the ETCO2. So what is the correlation between ETCO2 and the CO2 uh, uh, in uh, what we are seeing in ABG, like uh, partial pressure of CO2? Because many times we see that the ETCO2 is hardly 35, 40, but when we do ABG, the PC, PCO2 is going up to even um, 70, 80 or more than that. So I, is there a very linear correlation or is it's not that uh, very linear correlation? PG will definitely be higher. So what we see, the entitled carbon dioxide is much lower. Here, what you see, we put 50 as a cut of white transcutaneous carbon dioxide. Generally, we hover it around 50. Anything below 50, then you're worried that patient may develop sepsis because it is temperature regulated. So, ABG, I mean, transcutaneous is closer to ABG, not your ATCO. 
So these are basic guidelines through which you should know where, when you should stop a procedure. So, postgraduates who are attending this, they should be very clear Uh, I think um, we have uh, almost given our um, uh, comments. There are most of the questions are aimed at the same, uh, you know, la same line. Whether I can give midazolam, whether I can give fentanyl. Uh, if at all you are practicing some light, uh, some uh, mild sedation, uh, please go titrated, and do not exceed the doses. Try to maintain your uh, levels to just. Uh, he had given one scoring system, uh, Ramsey scale, scale 2. Please do not uh, make the patient obtunded in which you have to give tactile stimulation or you have to give a trapezius squeeze to wake up the patient. <laughs> so. yeah, I think ultimately the rule is titration. titration. <laughs> because I have seen patients sleeping with 2 milligrams, a patient, a 90 kg guy coming and sleeping with 2 ml of propofol. So, if you go with so the, the body weight, you are definitely in trouble. So, we, we always say the group is heterogeneous. We do not know the individual response to the drug. And uh, those of us who are not doing routinely sedation will find it difficult. So, it is better done by the, in the hands of a specialist. Definitely. I absolutely agree with you. Mm -hmm. So I think if there if there are no more questions, I think we can conclude the session. And uh, I would like to thank to Dr. Kajal Jain and Dr. Uh, Santosh sir for such an exhaustive and lucid lecture and uh, conducting the session so nicely. I think all the residents and the attendees must have learned a lot during the session. Uh, and uh, uh, with this, uh, I would like to also invite all of you for the next session, which will be which will be held on the twenty eighth of July. Same timing, my uh, speaker will be Dr. Sandeep Laktakya on the topic of uh, bilirubin biliary uh, on the topic of eva endoscopic evaluation of the biliary structures. Uh, so, with this, thank you everyone for joining and taking uh, out that time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.